Hello, my name is Subhu Venkatraman. I'm from the Industry Liaison Office from the National University of Singapore in charge of intellectual property management and commercialization. And um, I'd like to talk today about nanotechnology in medicine, sort of put it in perspective, um, what we have done well so far over 40, 50 years of research and what we hope to do better in the future. I talk about nanotechnology in medicine, we have to look at about four different areas of applications of nanoparticles. These include uh, the delivery of drugs, genes and vaccines, in vitro diagnostics using mostly colloidal gold nanoparticles that have resulted in a few products over the counter, such as for pregnancy testing, in vivo imaging, which is mostly using super paramagnetic nanoparticles and that have resulted in a few approved products for magnetic resonance imaging of uh, disease conditions. And then a fourth less well-defined area called bioactive materials where nano functionalization on the surfaces of, of devices, implanted devices, allow it to better integrate with the surrounding tissue. In today's talk, I'll talk mostly about the delivery of drugs and genes and vaccines. Uh, since this is the predominant market for nanomedicine, uh, resulting in upwards of five to six billion in sales in 2006, based on this article. Consisting mostly at that time of regulated drugs, which are considered nanoparticles, and then nanoliposomes for cancer chemotherapy using the passive targeting concept. This has grown to approximately 20 billion in 2020. And I will talk about how further growth is being fueled by recent successes in vaccine delivery. We have to also define exactly what the size range of particles is in this um, concept of nanomedicine. Typically, we talk about size, a size range of about one nanometer to about 100 nanometers. And the particles can be of various types, such as liposomes, nanoliposomes. This is one of the earliest nanoparticles used in cancer chemotherapeutics. We can have dendromers. Gold nanoparticles, as I mentioned earlier, quantum dots and fullerenes, and also three-dimensional uh, graphene-based nanoparticles or carbon-based nanoparticles. This is conventionally the size range that is accepted by most practitioners in the art as constituting nanoparticles or nanomedicine. So what's the advantage that nanoparticles offer over microparticles? There was a lot of promise early on for the application of nanoparticles in medicine. And this was fueled by something called the EPR effect, enhanced permeation and retention effect, that allows for systemic injection of nanoparticles and subsequent accumulation at the target size in appreciable amounts in order to affect the action that is desired of these nanoparticles, which could be killing cancer cells, for example. So in order to achieve this enhanced permeation and retention effect in the tissues of interest or target delivery, the size range that is appropriate is about 100 to 200 nanometers. And mostly neutral nanoparticles have been considered to have the maximum effect enhanced permeation and retention effect. I will talk a little bit more about exactly what this is, but this constitutes what we call passive targeting. And microparticles do not have or do not exhibit this EPR effect and therefore do not accumulate at the target site following injection. They are usually cleared by what is called the MPS recognition process and cleared from the system. Smaller particles are cleared through the kidney, filtration through the kidney, whereas larger particles undergo hepatic clearance and eventually MPS recognition and excretion. So the useful size range is about 100 to 200 nanometers. And why that is important uh, will become clear 
as we go along. So the basic concept of the basic idea of using nanoparticles um, over microparticles is the concept of improved biodistribution. So that is achieved through increased circulation half-life of the injected nanoparticles, as well as uh, better cellular penetration of the injected nanoparticles eventually when they reach the target sites. Their ability to pass through narrow capillaries, small capillaries surrounding cancer tissue, for example, also um, results in improved biodistribution. So all of these enable nanoparticles uh, to deliver therapeutics to the target size with minimal side effects. This is why they are preferred over microparticles, especially for targeted delivery. Another feature of nanoparticles which is useful for localized administration in the eye, for example, is their optical clarity because the smaller sizes compared to micron size particles, um, they feel less gritty in the eye as well as uh, uh, are optically clear so they do not obstruct vision. So this becomes important in localized administration in the eye of nanomedicines. The disadvantages of using nanoparticles are that the incorporated drug, in almost all cases, these have to be with drugs or with genes. Um, and this results, the size of the nanoparticles usually results in faster release of drugs, a tendency to agglomerate, as well as lower loading per particle of these uh, drugs and genes. Those need to be overcome in order to effectively incorporate nanoparticles into nanomedicine. The idea of passive and active targeting I had already mentioned earlier. The difference is that in passive targeting, what happens is that after you inject these particles into the bloodstream by intravenous infusion, they circulate in the body and the size of these nanoparticles enables them to first of all circulate longer than microparticles. And this is enhanced even further by functionalizing the surface of these particles with polyethylene glycol, something that is hydrophilic. That allows for long circulation half-lives. And because of this, statistically speaking, the chances of them ending up at the target site, which usually is a cancer, is usually cancer tissues surrounded by leaky blood vessels. So the size of these particles enables them to, to um, escape through these narrow capil uh, to, through, through the small capillaries into surrounding tissue, cancer tissue, accumulate there by what is called passive targeting, and then release their drugs or genes uh, to affect their action at the site that is uh, desired. So this was the basic concept, and this is sort of a necessary condition for targeted delivery. You could enhance the selectivity of action by functionalizing the surface of these particles with ligands that then allow it to selectively enter the cells that are targeted. So even if the passive accumulation at the site is not perfect in the sense that there are other tissues that may also be um, targeted by the nanoparticles, for example, liver and the spleen. The selectivity of action ensures that they only are effective on the cells of interest. So the side effects are reduced by a combination of passive targeting and active targeting. That was the original concept that drove the research into cancer chemotherapeutics or, pass or um, targeting of cancer tissues. How well this has uh, succeeded, we will talk about in the next few slides. So as I mentioned before, the size of these particles and surface functionalization of these particles enables both passive targeting and active targeting in principle. As a virtue of the long circulation half-life, this passive targeting is achieved and this is a necessary requirement for active targeting to work. But the corollary to this is that we have to accumulate enough of these particles at the site of interest, which is cancer tissues, 
in order for this to be effective. And this has been the problem with um, with the targeted delivery of these nanoparticles. The optimum size range, as I mentioned before, is 100 to 200 nanometers. The first product that was approved uh, was called Doxel in 1995 as a result of research at uh, three institutions, Alza Corporation in California, <clears throat> University of California at San Francisco, and Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And the concept was a fairly simple one. It involved um, self-assembled nanoliposomes incorporating a cytotoxic drug called the doxorubicin in the core of the nanoliposomes, which is surrounded by a bilayer that um, minimizes uh, efflux of these particles after injection into the bloodstream. So one of the important requirements is that the incorporated drug, while it is circulating, while these particles are circulating in the bloodstream, should not be released prematurely into the bloodstream. That defeats the purpose of um, enabling accumulation of the cancer site. So this was achieved by actively loading this doxorubicin in the core of the nanoparticle uh, to the extent of even crystallizing it so that premature release is prevented of these nanoparticles while they are circulating in the bloodstream. But this product is a passive targeted product. Uh, the only surface functionalization is polyethylene glycol, which enables it to escape the um, MPS recognition and cir circulate for longer periods in the blood. So this was the first approved product, the first uh, approved product which made use of passive targeting, does not involve active targeting. So side effects still persisted, were not eliminated completely because of accumulation in other tissues. Uh, not of interest. So to cut a long story short, in the subsequent uh, years following the approval of the first uh, Doxel product, many other nano liposomal products have been approved, but mostly variations on the same theme, um, which is simply to allow for better circulation half-lives and passive targeting. Abraxane is another example of uh, albumin nanoparticles that involve the use of paclitaxel. Also, the um, albumin nanoparticles circulate for longer times in the bloodstream after infusion and then passively accumulate at the target sites. The other three products that were uh, approved uh, in this period were all magnetic, paramagnetic um, or super paramagnetic nanoparticles involving iron, mostly used for MRI imaging. And these have since uh, had um, marginal success in uh, targeting lesions and diagno early diagnosis of lesions. In the drug delivery space, other attempts have been made to optimize both passive and active targeting. Uh, companies like Calo and Do and Bind Therapeutics were involved. And these have not been entirely successful and uh, most of the active targeting has been sort of overtaken by immunotherapy in recent years, such as the CAR T cell therapies and so on that allow for much more selective targeting of tissues. So a mixed uh, record for targeted therapy using nanoparticles. Passive targeting has been successful, but as I will show later, accumulation of the site is not, um, is not uh, very high. And this has retarded progress in this idea of passive targeting concepts. For diagnostics, some successes, but uh, Imaging sim still see seems um, inadequate and needs further uh, refinement and optimization. So the uh, basic uh, failure of uh, passive targeting or the basic failure of passive targeting to reach larger areas of application um, is because of this problem that only about 0.7% of the injected dose accumulates in the target tissue. 
The rest of it accumulates in the liver and in the spleen, predominantly in the liver, more in the uh, some in the in the spleen as well as in the bone marrow, causing side, unwanted side effects. So the liver accumulation in particular is unavoidable for any systemically injected nanoparticle. And 0.7% of the injected dose is sometimes not enough to, to have uh, selectivity of action. But the accumulation in the liver can be exploited, for example, for siRNA or gene silencing therapeutics, as I will show. That was the next frontier that was overcome by nanomedicine. So to summarize here at this stage, targeted delivery using systemic administration has had limited success, but better success of liver targeting was uh, achieved with siRNA therapeutics. <clears throat> and this involves the development of long acting uh, siRNA delivery systems as well as the concept of localized delivery in order to enhance selectivity of action. So systemic injection of siRNA delivery systems is successful in suppressing production of liver proteins that are detrimental in some disease conditions, but it can also be utilized in localized administration such as in ocular therapeutics. So just to recap the discovery of siRNA was made in 1996. Um, it resulted in a Nobel Prize for the inventors, but its um, application in medicine has not been um, entirely successful with very few products reaching the market. And only recently, very recently in the last three to four years uh, with the advent of the nanotechnology has uh, siRNA delivery been made successful. So delivery using just the injection of siRNA into the bloodstream has been unsuccessful, completely unsuccessful. And it does need a nano carrier in order for it to be effective. Although several patterns have been generated in the siRNA delivery space for the last several years, 30 to 40 years, uh, including microRNA delivery, which is also used in gene silencing. I have given some numbers here, representative numbers here. The number of approved products um, has not been very, very high, and I will show you why in a minute. This is because if you try to inject uh, the newly discovered siRNA that inhibits the production of protein from some tissue. If you inject it systemically, what happens is that the siRNA is easily cleared or quickly cleared by the reticuloendothelial system. Smaller siRNA particles are cleared through kidney filtration, while larger particles um, are cleared through MPS recognition. Those that uh, escape the clearance and end up in the tissue of interest are unable to penetrate um, penetrate the tissue of interest, uh, to penetrate cells in the surrounding tissue because they lack the mechanism, endocytic pathway um, mechanism of penetration. Some of these siRNA particles are also degraded by nucleases while either in circulating in the bloodstream or inside the tissues of interest. So all of these uh, basically resulted in, um, in clearance of the injected siRNA particles fairly quickly after administration. And therefore it needed the incorporation into nanoparticles in order to increase circulation half-lives and accumulation at the, C at the site of interest but also to enable them to enter the cells. So the additional requirement for these particles or for the siRNA is to enable them to enter the cells of interest into the cytoplasm in order to inhibit the protein production in that particular cell. So this is summarized in this slide. The, um, the degradation, um, and the clearance can be 
prevented or minimized by encapsulation or by localized delivery of these particles. In any case, encapsulation is absolutely essential to prevent degradation by nucleases. Um, cellular penetration can be enhanced by the nano size as well as by the positively by the incorporation of positive charges on the surface. This was what was exploited by companies such as Alnylam Pharmaceuticals, which developed several particles, uh, different types of particles, including lipid nanoparticles, uh, conjugates uh, with Galnac, and so on, that was systemically administered but targeted a liver protein production of a liver protein or inhibition of production of a liver protein. So the accumulation at the liver that I mentioned earlier of these injected nanoparticles enables this action to be very, very selective. So most of these conditions, hypercholesteremia, TTR-mediated amyloidosis, for which particles have been approved by the FDA, um, are liver, are liver targeted pro uh, liver targeted nanoparticles that inhibit the production of a liver protein that is detrimental for these conditions so this was the major success um, of um, nanoparticles nanocarriers incorporating siRNA for inhibition of production of liver proteins so as I say um, Three products have been approved in this space, uh, mostly because of the fact that the injected, systemically injected nanoparticles accumulate in liver, accumulate in liver tissue. How about um, localized administration? Can this help to selectively deliver gene silencing molecules? Is the question that we asked ourselves a few years ago. And the answer is, uh, yes, there are applications if you can localize the administration of these particles, you can enhance selectivity and also enhance efficacy of action. So one condition that we looked at uh, was ocular fibrosis. So for many patients with very severe glaucoma, uh, the only intervention that helps is surgical intervention that um, opens up a channel for efflux of the aqueous humor that uh, accumulates in the front of the eye. Uh, this is called glaucoma filtration surgery. And this channel that is opened, unfortunately, sometimes recloses in many patients uh, following surgery, and the patient has to come back again for another surgical procedure. So uh, this is caused by fibrosis of the channel that was open surgically. And uh, the only um, option nowadays is to simply dab the area with uh, very cytotoxic drugs such as 5-FU that unfortunately results in the killing of other cells, other cell types in the vicinity, not just the fibroblasts that are involved in fibrosis and that increases the risk of blinding complications. So this is what we targeted using SARNA delivery into fibroblasts that prevents the production of a protein that is involved in fibrosis. So the idea was to deliver locally by subconjunctival injection enough of these nanoparticles. Um, and these are protected against um, nuclease degradation and then uh, they enter fibroblasts where they selectively prevent the production of a protein that is involved in fibrosis. The particle that we ended up using um, was a nanoparticle with uh, what we call layer by layer functionalization, alternating layers of siRNA and a cationic polymer, polyalarginine, with the outermost layer being the cationic polymer that allows it to enter fibroblasts fairly easily. More importantly, it also allowed for uh, endosomal escape of these particles after entry into fibroblasts that allowed for sustained action. So the uh, siRNA was delivered within the cells 
over a period of time up to at least 14 days and that, that allowed for sustained um, action over at least two weeks which is the period of healing that results in fibrosis and we validated this with an animal model following a surgery into the eye in the eye followed by subconjectival injection of these nanoparticles that has proven successful in animal trials and awaits further validation in humans but it also showed us that uh, there are several other conditions where local administration could benefit fibrosis cardiac fibrosis for example following infarction um, um, ocular fibrosis which I've already mentioned and fibrosis that uh, that sort of chokes off uh, islet uh, nutrition following injection for diabetic patients is also another important area where localized administration or surface functionalization of the islets can allow for minim minimal fibrosis minimized fibrosis as well as in abdominal surgery so many possibilities uh, exist for localized administration of nanoparticles that results in selective and sustained action. So to summarize at this stage for SIRNA delivery, targeted gene silencing using nanotechnology, as I mentioned, works well for liver protein production or inhibition of uh, liver protein production. And three products have already been approved in this space for hypercholestemia, amyloidosis, and acute hepatic porphyria. Targeted delivery may also be achieved with localized administration where this is possible, especially in immunocompromised tissues, such as ocular tissue, for treatment of ocular disease. So this is possible with SIRNA delivery for both uh, liver protein production as well as for fibrosis in several tissues. What about the area of mRNA therapeutics where you are actually encouraging the production of a protein rather than inhibiting it? Well, nanotechnology for mRNA vaccines and therapeutics have been considered for a long time, have been researched for a long time. Um, so before the onvent of COVID vaccines, the projection for the market size potential was fairly limited. In 2019, it was about 0.5 billion uh, for both infectious disease and for cancer, and was expected to grow to about 2.9 billion in 2026 with cancer uh, therapeutics being the more dominant of the two. Post-COVID, this situation has changed in the following way, in that the market size in 2021 dominated entirely by the COVID vaccines is about 9.1 billion and is expected to grow at about 10% to 15 billion in 2026. And like I said, the predominant uh, share of this market is for vaccines for infectious disease, but cancer vaccines could also play a very important role in the years to come. So what COVID has done really in a perverse sort of way is to open up the market for mRNA therapeutics significantly with the huge success of the mRNA vaccines. And there are, uh, there have been many mRNA based vaccines in the clinic for a long period of time but they have not enjoyed the success that the COVID vaccines have enjoyed. So there have been vaccines against HIV, rabies virus, Zika virus, and influenza virus, but um, this has not enjoyed a uh, huge application. Like I said, in a perverse sort of way, the pandemic has enabled the emergency use authorization of several of these vaccines quickly enough to Yes, to, to, to show that they are very effective and can be used for many other disease conditions. The vaccine candidates for COVID, there are two leading candidates that have been approved for emergency use authorization. These are the BioNTech and Pfizer um, vaccine, which involves the use of mRNA um, for spike protein production 
and uh, uses a lipid nanoparticle, cationic lipid nanoparticle, as does the uh, Moderna therapeutic, uh, sorry, Moderna uh, vaccine for mRNA, so uses a slightly different mRNA, uh, stabilized mRNA, stabilized against uh, uh, nucleus degradation and so on. And the dosing regimen is slightly different, but both of them involve at least two doses. A third one that is under development in Singapore with a company called Arcturus uh, Therapeutics and Duke NUS makes use of a self-amplifying and replicating RNA concept for mRNA that may do away with the two doses that are currently required, although the clinical trials are being done currently with two doses. And it also involves um, the use of a cationic lipid which uh, releases all of the uh, mRNA fairly uh, quickly after entering the cytoplasm, as does these two vaccines, as do these two vaccines. Um, while we are working on a concept for sustained release of these nanoparticles after entering the, um, entering the muscle cells of interest uh, following intradermal injection. And that is a uh, an extension of the concept that we mentioned before for SARNA therapeutics, except that the SARNA layers are replaced by mRNA layers with the cationic polyalarginin at the outermost uh, layer, as the outermost layer that enables facile uh, endocytic penetration of the muscle cells of interest after internal injection. So this is also a concept we are working on in Singapore at the moment that we hope will have um, single dose stabilized um, vaccine applications. So in summary of the status and what I think will be useful for the future is that uh, first of all, nanotechnology is the key component for selective and non-selective saRNA and mRNA therapeutics. Without nanotechnology, these two bioactive molecules will not be delivered to the target tissue. And uh, systemic targeted delivery is still elusive following intravenous injection, except for, as I mentioned before, um, liver-based protein production, which naturally are targeted by systemic injection. So although there could be some more products generated by liver targeting, I think, more products can be um, can be uh, targeted using using localized administration. The explosive growth in vaccine concepts and their huge success for infectious disease will spur research into cancer vaccines and cancer therapeutics using mRNA, and I, I think the potential here is is considerable. For including the use of um, these mRNA nanocarriers for in situ antibody therapeutics, with selected tissues again being addressed um, by the idea of um, localized administration. So the future is very bright for mRNA therapeutics and vaccines, and this is where nanotechnology is poised to play a very key role. Thank you for your attention.